My guest today is Greg Christ. Greg, how are you, sir? I'm pretty good today. How are you? I'm doing great. Tell me, what do you do for a living? Sure. I'm a um, solution architect at a company called Elastic, and I work in our partner organization. So I work with our business partners, uh, technology partners, services partners, and helping them understand Elastic from a technology point of view and how to apply, how they can uh, use it as part of their services and um, with their existing customers. Okay. Yeah. And that's uh, Elastic has a number of products, but um, and you deal with a lot of different technologies, but we want to talk about observability today. That's something that I asked you what you want to talk about. And I think you have a lot of expertise in this area and a lot of passion for it. Can you start by defining observability? I think I can. Sure. To me, and I think to most of the industry, observability is really how do I manage my IT infrastructure and maintain its performance and its uptime, meet the objectives that I've set uh, from my IT department. So that really goes from site reliability engineers who are responsible for keeping a website up and running uh, to monitoring my customer's experience if I am on an e-commerce site, right? Are they, are they able to search and find what they're looking for in a timely manner? And uh, is it not cause, it could cause me revenue issues if that customer can not, can't, can't access or can't find what they're looking for on my website. So it, it's, it's a pretty broad range of, um, of capabilities and responsibilities for an IT organization. But, and it has to, you know, it's also the development rollout, right? It's part of when I need to roll out updates or new applications, that process as well. I mean, uh, having that process, having those applications roll out successfully and um, and provide uh, cap the new capabilities that they're they're meant to address. All so, right. a lot of it uh, boils down to um, monitoring, right? Mon keeping track of what's happening, and then maybe recording it in logs, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. And a lot of software systems, I have hardware, or software generate logs automatically, right? Whether it's a database, an operating system, a firewall, they all generate logs. Um, in different formats, in different frequencies, um, but they all they all generate different kinds of logs. Yeah, talk a little about how that helps you to do things like <clears throat> manage the uptime or manage the dev rollout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that traditionally people have used logs to uh, react to a problem, and observability has to do with being able to get in front of issues, right? So in the past, in the history. Historically, uh, people have been re reactive, right? Somebody's called and said, hey, my website's down. Hey, I'm trying to access this application. And it, I'm, it's either slow or not responding. And so I have to go figure that out. And so what people do go, okay, well, that's on this server. Let's go see if it's up. Okay, let's go look at the log files uh, for the operating system or the database or uh, the firewall. Um, look at the network traffic and try to try to figure out what, you know, all reactive, right? All trying to figure out what went wrong and trying to correlate between them. So, okay, I can see that the, uh, the application is generating logs and it's saying it's having resource issues, but then I have to go and look at the metrics of the system. What's the CPU utilization? What's the memory utilization? Uh, what's the disk IO on that VM or server, uh, et cetera? So then I have to correlate. Okay, and I'm looking at, they're all timestamps, right? So I have to manually, I've had in the past, I've had to kind of manually match those things together okay. between the, the logs and the metrics and the application traces. So the application is generating logs, the operating system is generating logs. And I, I've got a historical view of what the CPU utilization was. But in the past, I'd have to grab each of those separately dump them into a spreadsheet or something someplace and kind of look at them together and to try to get a complete picture of what's happening. That was the past that suggests that maybe it's different now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, and that's kind of how the company I work at elastic evolved. You know, we, we were, uh, a, a, a system that was developed for search to be able to search through petabytes of data 
in, uh, in, in very fast time, unstructured data, right, from different formats. And so people started using that for logs because they didn't want to open these text files and do a text, you know, a match and then try to find an error message or something like that across, you know, it could generate a log file every hour, could be once a day, different systems generate them in different ways. So I got to find which log file and then find the information within it. And so people started ingesting that uh, into Elastic and saying, hey, maybe it's easier to find things and correlate things if I could bring all these log files from different formats all into Elastic. And uh, over time, uh, we recognized that that was a business opportunity at, at Elastic and said, hey, we can build some tools on top of that. We can make it easier for these uh, engineers to figure out uh, what's happening in their systems. So we built a common, what we call the Elastic Common Schema, which we've now donated to open source. That allows the timestamp to be kind of the key and then have a lot of other co common field names like a host, like an IP address, um, those kinds of things that are common in some of these different log formats. So I have this common schema that allows me to switch between those log files and those metrics. So we started saying, hey, we people also want to ingest metrics. And so let's get in the hardware, uh, CPU utilization, the, the memory utilization, et cetera, those metrics, and the application traces. So I've got all of these different things, what we call traces, metrics, and logs. We're bringing them together in one place so that I don't have to swivel or switch windows or switch between applications to evaluate any of those. I can, I can look at them all in one place and try to help to, determine uh, what went wrong, right? So those are all retro, still retroactively trying to figure out what's wrong, but um, at least I've got the data in one place and I've got all the data for, for all the different systems that I may have. Um, and that's grown over time, you know, as people have moved applications to Kubernetes, uh, pods, containers, there's a different set of log files, there's a different set of parameters that are, that are wrapped around those as well. And so we need, to, we need, we built in the ability to incorporate that information as well. So I not only have my traditional applications that I can um, look at, but I can also look at more modern applications that are, you know, based on Kubernetes or any other uh, of those latest technologies. Hmm. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, when you're trying to correlate uh, the, what happened, you'd usually do it by the timestamp. Something bad happened at one seventeen in the morning. Let's go look at all these files and uh, find out what was going on at one seventeen in the morning with uh, the mm -hmm. CPU usage and with the application logs or whatever. Um, but uh, I think that uh, even if you bring them together, you still have that timestamp to correlate them on. Unless you mentioned traces, I think traces help make that a little bit easier, right? Yeah, absolutely. So application traces, you can see, you can see, you can start to see response times, right? So with an application trace, I can see what's the latency between one service and another when they're calling. And I can see that over time, how it's, I can track that, you know, in graphs and charts, how that latency is changing over time, where normally it's, you know, seven to 25 milliseconds. And then all of a sudden it, it goes to a hundred milliseconds or two seconds. Um, I, I, I can see those uh, changes over time with those application traces. I can also build a service map so I can see what what services are calling other services and how they're related to each other and start to trace which ones are using up the most CP. Because I have the metrics, I can see which of these services, if it takes a total of five seconds to respond when a customer searches for a product or puts a product in their shopping cart, for example, I can see all the different, cap all my different services and which ones are taking up the most latency and again, the, as a developer or as a, as a site reliability engineer, I can start to narrow down and say, hey, if I can improve this process, this one sub processor, this one service, that could affect my overall uh, latency time for my, for my customer impact uh, response time. So that's, uh, uh, traces can help with that as well. It can help a developer, the software developer, and not just the guy who's maintaining the application or trying to keep it up and running. Oh, you just alluded to something I was going to ask about, which is uh, you started out talking about being reactive, that mm -hmm. oh, a problem occurred. Let's go dig into it and find out why that problem occurred. But when we talk about, you know, uh, optimizing a piece of the application that's slow, then you're being proactive. And right. How, how does observability help you to be more proactive? Yeah. And so, uh, again, as this, as this has evolved over the last you know, 10 years or so, there's a lot of um, mathematical algorithms that can help you analyze these massive amounts of data. 
And so as, you know, and the traces are one way where I can, as a, as a developer, I can look at real user activity and see over time what services are being used the most, what section of my code is not being hardly used at all, where can I really optimize it? But also um, the machine learning algorithms also can do things like anomaly detection. So it can see that, um, you know, normally the response time for this particular service is generally between, as I said, like five or 25 milliseconds to respond. And when there's a spike in that activity, the machine learning algorithms are, they've been trained on what's been the historical norms for this, these applications or these services or the network traffic or whatever you're monitoring. And so when there is a change, there's an anomaly, it can create an alert and that can help you to be more proactive, both as the operations team, as well as the developer. I can say, hey, all of a sudden, the, resp the latency on this particular service has slowed down over the last five minutes. Uh, maybe, you, so let's pop out an alert. Let's let somebody know so they can proactively uh, go and uh, investigate before maybe the service goes completely down. You might find an issue that's running out of disk space or memory, or um, you need to switch over to, uh, to another server because there's something going wrong with that one. Um, so anomaly detection is one way, also correlations. So I can, I can, we can run correlation analysis to say, when there is an anomaly, when there's something out of the ordinary, um, what's correlated with that? So normally the log, you know, let's say an application is generating uh, 100 log entries per minute, right? And all of a sudden it's generating 10,000 logs per minute instead of 100. What's different about those log messages and which fields are different? So is it coming from a different service? on that application, or is it coming from a different um, username or IP address or one of the fields, it can identify the correlations that are related. Not only is the number of messages different, but these data fields in the rows themselves are different as well. And so I, that'll help, again, direct the uh, site reliability engineer on where to, where to target his investigation, and where to start uh, trying to uncover what could be an issue. Uh, I, you brought up machine learning. I, I, I knew we we're going to have some kind of artificial intelligence field <laughs> as part of this because everybody's talking yeah. about that. Is mm -hmm. are these machine learning algorithms? Are they the the way that we can implement uh, AI, or are we? Is there more that is being built in using AI mm -hmm. into observability? Yeah, yeah. So it was interesting. I've been in Elastic a couple of years now, a little over two years. And I came from a machine learning background. So I, I used to work, yeah, I used to work for a company called SPSS, which uh, if you ever took statistics in college, uh, you pro back, probably not today, you probably use Python, but 10 years or more ago, if you went to college, you probably used SPSS in your stats class. And it did regression analysis and some machine learning as well. And um, so I look, you know, I learned about machine learning, you know, 10, 15 years ago about how to really apply and it's mostly numerical analysis, right? It's analyzing numbers and rates and uh, things like that. But it can do it can do text analysis and so forth. But um, so Elastic has had that capability for many years to do anomaly detection. There's pretty straightforward algorithms around that, looking uh, looking at those analyses. And we've had hundreds and hundreds, like three or four hundred different machine learning jobs that come out of the box. You can train, the, you can build your own as well. Uh, you can train your own models select the data sources that you want to look at and the types of anomalies you want to look for. Uh, they're used for security as well. So if you're looking at data that's being, um, where IP addresses that are that are unusual, that are not normally, or people log in at odd hours, they always log in between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And all of a sudden for the last two days, they've been logging in at 2 a.m. Hey, something's different there. Or a bunch of data is being exfiltrated out of my network to an IP address in a country that it doesn't normally travel to. All of those things that are anomaly like detections. bad news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are all, those are all anomalies, right? They're things that yeah. are not out of the ordinary. When you're, when you're, when this massive amounts of data is being generated, no human can just look at it and say, Hey, all of a sudden it's looking different, but these machine learning algorithms can just do it, you know, in a matter of seconds and say, Hey, something's way off right now. That's we, I've seen something I've never seen before, whether it's higher volumes, or unique, uh, unique log messages. It can even look for that. So there's a message in my log file that I only see once a month. All of a sudden it's popped up three times today. Hey, something must be different. So let's just alert somebody about that. 
So that kind of takes me into the the latest conversation that everybody wants to talk about in the last, what, 18 months now, which is generative AI. And how can I use generative AI from an observability point of view? If I'm a site reliability engineer, how can I take advantage of this technology and start to think about, again, more automation and less manual activity? Because like, like everybody else in IT these days, the uh, operations teams are being asked to do more and more, uh, at, service more applications at higher um, levels of, of service, you know, less downtime. And uh, so they're always, you're always looking to automate. Um, it, you, and then budgets aren't growing, right? As the responsibilities grow, the budgets don't grow. So you have to find ways to use technology to become more efficient. And so with generative AI, what we have in, in Elastic and what uh, people are using today is uh, what we call the AI assistant, which is how can I have a, I can have a conversation with an, uh, I can have a conversation with chat GPT. I can say, Hey, what is, what is Oracle, right? Or what is, wh what are, what are these log messages mean? And uh, when should I see these log messages? But those are just asking, you know, general, general models that have been trained on random tons of data and having a conversation. So the re retrieval augmented generation is the ability to use your private data uh, along with a large language model to, to do generative AI. And so we've built that into Elastic where we, we can do, again, because we're a search company, an AI powered search company, we can store all, we can search across all this log information and use the log information as part of uh, creating a prompt to a large language model in generative AI. So what that means is I can ask it, hey, I see this uh, error message in my logs. Um, is, it, is it a problem or are there any important alerts today? Or can you summarize the alerts that I have in, in my open, in, in my open uh, inbox today? And it can look at the data that you have in the logs, in the metrics, in the traces, and understand the relationships there and, uh, and create a, a conversation with you. In addition to that, it's got, it also has a knowledge base capability. So as it learns, you can store that in the knowledge base and it can use that. So if you've seen that problem before, I can store that in the, law, in the, um, in the knowledge base. And the next time a, a, someone runs into that, they can ask the assistant and it will, will know uh, what, are the, what are the best response steps or what uh, action should I take? So I can take all of that private information. Um, we also have more and more customers adding in business data. So you think about Elastic and, and all these logs and metrics and traces I talk about. The other thing they're starting to put in is business data. So maybe just some summary data about revenue or maybe their service level objectives that they've defined, the, the guarantees that they've made to their users or their customers about the application availability, uh, the services availability that they're offering. And so you can use that in context as well. So I could ask a, you know, I could ask a question of the assistant, like, is this alert causing me to lose revenue or what's the revenue impact of this system being down? And it can use that revenue data in context with all the log data, um, historical revenue data and say, hey, you know, this is costing you, you know, $5,000 a minute uh, when your e-commerce website is not available. And it's uh, interacting with things like Azure OpenAI for the, with a large language model to, to, to create those conversations, generate the text back with that private information. And so that, that allows the assistant, or the, I'm sorry, the site reliability engineer to interact with the assistant and do that job much more quickly. You know, and, and over time, we're, you know, over time people are looking to automate as much as possible. So can I, is there an automated response? I guess, you know, now it's looking beyond what we can do today, but what's, kind of future of observability is kind of uh, what could I automate? What could I have the system when it sees a certain set of, um, of alerts, how could I automatically respond to that? I see. So, so you're using this uh, RAG pattern, the retrieval augmented generation, I think is the acronym. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you, so the users can use a natural language like English, for example, to execute queries against the logs without having to understand the syntax of the, the whatever that query language is, uh, and yep. also to, to search a knowledge base and to maybe even correlate those logs with your business data. So you're you're pointing, the you're augmenting your searches 
with the logs, the monitor, the observability information, your knowledge base, and your business data. Well, you know, what's what's your revenue and expenses and things like that, yeah. and being able yeah, to exactly. tie those back together and respond in a natural mm -hmm. language like English. Yep, exactly. That sounds really, really cool. I like that's a great application of generative AI. I think people are people are searching for uses of generative AI. They know it's important, but they don't know how it's important to their business. And I think that you yeah, found a yeah, good exactly. use for it right there. Um, talk, uh, is there, are, do you have a roadmap for um, the observability tools within Elastic? Like what's coming next? Uh, I, th I think more and more um, it's, it's around taking that generative AI capabilities and making it smarter. So, you know, looking at um, analysis, and uh, being able to do more of the correlations mm -hmm. and, and around um, not only um, the the application tra traces, but things around uh, what we call synthetic monitoring, which is you can set up uh, jobs, you can set up services in the background that will uh, simulate a user's experience. So I can say, I'm coming to my e-commerce website with a Chrome browser from the country of Japan, and I and I'm searching for product um, X Y Z, and then I'm checking the price on that product and the inventory availability. So I can create a step, a series of steps that I want to execute against my website, and have it run that every five minutes, once an hour, and again that generates a bunch more data around response times. But that's from, that's simulated user experience, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you think about observability and application tracing, I'm looking at it from my side of the world, right? From the services side, how is my services responding? This what's called real user monitoring or synthetic monitoring is looking at it from my customers or my users experience. And I'm simulating that and I'm getting collecting data basically on the user side as opposed to the application side. So I have, again, two, two, two sets of data there that I can bring together uh, along with all the traditional logs and, and metrics to gain a better understanding and more quickly be alerted about issues, you know, especially for, you know, multinationals and they have websites around the world and they have replicated servers running around the world. This can help you to, to manage all of that uh, infrastructure when they literally have thousands and thousands of pods and services that are running around the world and uh, across the cloud, their cloud environment. Totally makes sense. Um... Is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is critical to this topic? Um, I think that's a pretty good area. I think, um, you know, just the only thing I haven't really talked about from the Elastic point of view is, you know, we're a very open company. Everything uh, that I've talked about is available on our website in our documentation. It's all, it's all API driven as well. So everything's open. There is a, an open source version that people can use that has the basic capabilities. So they can start with something simple and grow it. Um, we talked about the AI assistant, AI operations. Um, it interacts also with uh, things like ServiceNow, uh, tools where you may be managing cases and, and so forth. So as I'm collecting information and I'm using a case management system, it can interact with that. And so I can open cases, close cases, and do all of those types of things as well. So I think that's, um, you know, that, those are the areas that I thought would be interesting to people today. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the website, it is elastic.co. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yep. I will put that in the show notes. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Greg, thank you so much for your time. This has been really educational. No, I, I appreciate it. I, I'm glad to talk to you today. And it's always fun to talk about observability. I think that technology for me is a way to uh, broaden the experiences of my friends because I have a lot of friends outside of the technology world and they come to me for advice and, and, and interest. And so it helps me in my job to be able to explain technology to my friends uh, in a non-technology way. So I, I figure out how to communicate it to how can I, how can I explain to them what the, what my job is and how it helps, um, how it helps the, the IT world.